we've seen an incredible increase in the amount of young men who are not employed, who spend more time on video games, more time smoking mm -hmm. marijuana, addicted to pornography. Ultimately, it's because I think we've created a society that rejects masculinity. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. This week, we're going to talk about a crisis that strikes at the heart of our country, our society, and ultimately our families, what I like to call the boy crisis. And later, I'm going to react to some woke children's books, be sure you watch that, and talk about how the left is attempting to radicalize our kids. If this is your first time watching the show, welcome. For those returning, we're glad to have you back. Thanks for subscribing. Each week, we're charging the hills, taking on the issues and problems that we need to in order to keep America free and prosperous. And we're equipping you to join us in that fight. Young men and boys, just to be straight with you, have been left behind. By eighth grade, for example, 41% of girls are at least proficient in writing. And by the way, that statistic is bad enough. 41% of girls are at least proficient in writing. It ought to be 100%. But compare that 41% with just 20% of boys who in eighth grade are proficient in writing. In addition, 15 to 19 year old boys commit suicide at four times the rate of girls. This, if you wanna talk about epidemics, is one. Men are earning fewer college degrees than women. Just visit your neighborhood college campus, whether it's a community college campus, a four-year university, a graduate program. Nothing against the women who are in school, obviously, but clearly something has changed in American society. It means that a larger percentage of men are just getting a high school education and no more. And look, for a long time, I've been a proponent of vocational education. I think more American men and women need to be choosing that over four-year schools, not because they're not intelligent, but because there's a certain virtue that comes from working from our hands. But they're not even doing that. That's the problem. Average earnings for those men who just have a high school education have dropped 26% in the past 40 years. Contrast that reality for them with what we're all undergoing right now, which is very serious inflation. And you can begin to understand why economics and pocketbook issues really are both a reflection of society as well as affecting some social decisions. At the heart of this, I am sorry to say, is absenteeism of fathers. It is the primary driver of what we're calling the boy crisis. Children are missing their father's influence. 40% of American children are born out of wedlock. And if you look at state custody laws, all of them, 100% of them, favor mothers rather than providing balanced time between mothers and fathers. Once again, to be clear, because I'm charged with being politically incorrect all the time, nothing against moms. But can we also say it's time that we have nothing against dads? The effect on boys of all of these problems is clear and it's tragic. And I'm not using the word tragic to be melodramatic. We see higher rates among boys of suicide, of drug use, of violence, of poverty, and of ADHD. And on that latter point, a huge problem. I remember this one of my favorite students. You're not supposed to have favorite students as a teacher. But one of my favorite students I still keep up with 15, 20 years later, very serious case of ADHD, a young high school guy. And he was on very serious medication. And even with that medication for ADHD, he still had some behavioral problems. And if we had used at the school that I started, where I had him as a student, our disciplinary measures on him, he would have been expelled by the third week. What I mean is, even at the school that I started, where we were sensitive about making sure that we were treating boys as fairly as we were treating girls, those disciplinary procedures on this young man who had a cross to bear he was not responsible for would have been so strict, he would have been expelled. So you know what we did? When he started acting up a little bit, we would turn to him and say, it's time to go run a couple of laps around the campus. And what, by that, we were not trying to penalize him. We were just trying to get him out of that very constrained environment. Even as I sit here in this chair, I myself want to get out of this chair and go outside and breathe some air. That's the point. Our American education system, American society, in an attempt to be fair to all, especially women, has inverted the playing field against boys and against young men. Obviously, this is a huge problem. There are repercussions of many things going on here. One of them is the sexual revolution and radical feminism. 
In the 1970s, the National Organization for Women pushed for custody laws favoring women, not in the best interest of children. And so modern feminism became an interest group representing only women rather than women and their children. I would like to think wherever we may be on the political spectrum, we understand that everyone should be treated fairly, and especially when we're dealing with the scourge of divorce, when we're thinking about the hard decisions to be made about state custody laws, that at the, at the forefront, we are considering the best case for the children involved. Contrast modern feminism, which we're living under, especially in the nation's capital every day, with first wave feminists, as they were called who wanted basic equality under the law as full citizens, obviously a fair and noble objective. They understood, for example, that citizens also had duties to society and to family. And so when they were advocating for women's rights, they were also advocating for the family. That's no longer the case as we think about, especially the rhetoric in 2021 and 2022 surrounding modern feminism. This dilemma is exacerbated by the left's desire to dismantle the whole idea of the family. And for those of you who say that I'm being radical in saying that, the evidence is really clear. You can look at the policies of left of center political officials here in D.C. in state capitals. You can look at how the male and female roles are attacked. You can look at how healthy masculinity is often discussed as toxic masculinity, as our guest will soon talk about. And we can also say that fathers, and I am lament this, fathers have been replaced with government welfare checks. There is a massive push for woke gender ideologies, as we'll talk about at the end of the show. And to give you perhaps the most condemning example I can of how one sliver of the radical left wants to undermine the American family, Black Lives Matter, which I'm supposed, I'm, I know I'm not supposed to attack because it would be politically incorrect, but the organization Black Lives Matter on its website says verbatim that they want to change the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. So for those of us who've been attacking the organization Black Lives Matter for two years for being neo-Marxist and radical, obviously that phrase proves the point. But it's even worse because all of this is focused on stripping parental rights in the realm of education. Basically, as I have come to say many times over the last few months, we're no longer educating American students, we're indoctrinating them. And we're indoctrinating them with a radical leftist ideology that has pushed aside anything that's objective, anything that's common sense in education. Ultimately, as I've experienced in my own career as an educator, the left attempts to silence those who oppose them. Witness our friends like Ryan Anderson, longtime colleague here at the Heritage Foundation, who has been silenced for speaking out about the push for transgender ideology. Witness, for example, the almost daily challenge we have here at the Heritage Foundation and on our media platform, The Daily Signal, being censored by YouTube. But as you know, I like to say what reality is, but also get to solutions. So you would fairly ask the question, Kevin, how in the world can we fix this? First of all, anyone who sees themselves as a feminist ought to return to first wave feminism. That's not just great, it's awesome. It's great for society. You need to reject modern feminism, which actually is actually harmful to women when you start thinking about it. Secondly, let me be clear, guy to guy, we need fathers to take responsibility. So this isn't just something where men passively have been the object, sort of the victims of, of social pressure. Men need to step up and take responsibility, not just in the social arena, but also in the political arena as well. And thirdly, when we think about policy solutions that really can reflect a return to common sense, we need state legislators to improve state custody laws in favor of children. And by doing so, we will find that society is a heck of a lot healthier. And I would suspect that in 5, 10, 15 years, we will see some elements of this boy crisis abate. Fighting for a future like this, one with families as our societal building block and foundation, is something that our next guest and my very good friend, Terry Schilling, is committed to. He's a father, he's a patriot, and he serves as the president of the American Principles Project. If you're unaware, it's an organization dedicated to making the family the most well-represented special interest group here in our nation's capital. 
That's a tall order when you consider all of the well-paid lobbyists on K Street surrounding the Capitol, but it's one that's aspirational that the Heritage Foundation fully endorses. We're going to speak with him and about the work of the American Principles Project. But first, we're going to get a quick briefing from our colleague Brenda Hefera, one of Heritage's experts in this area, for a bit more context. Don't forget to subscribe to The Kevin Roberts Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please give the show a five-star rating while you're at it. We really appreciate it because it helps us to reach more people with a message of freedom and one of hope for our future. Stay with us. I'll be right back with Terry Schilling. Our boys are in crisis. 15 to 19-year-old boys commit suicide at four times the rate of girls. 41% of girls are at least proficient in writing compared to just 20% of boys. This issue has been overlooked because we have accepted the premise of identity politics feminism over holistic feminism. It's the oppressed versus the oppressor in a zero-sum game. But that just isn't true. Improving literacy for boys doesn't mean it will drop for girls. And we aren't talking about an enemy. We're talking about our boys. And we love our boys. These are our sons, brothers, the future fathers of our children. Shouldn't we care about what is happening to them? American women are more than an interest group. We are spirited citizens capable of fighting for ourselves and our families, community, and country. And ladies, it's time to help our boys. My friend Terry Schilling, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. You're smiling because you know that I'm worried. <laughs> you're worried that maybe you're going to say something and I'm going to regret that you were on the show. But I'm not worried. I'm happy you're on. My plan is just to get it to that line and not cross it. So we'll, we'll make things interesting and fun. For yeah, sure. that, that sounds good. You do that all the time as, <laughs> as evidenced by your shoes. For those of you who are watching and not just listening, uh, Terry Schilling, of course, has his, his uh, trademark, very colorful shoes. <laughs> But all kidding aside, you're a very important fixture in the conservative movement at a young age. What you're doing personally with your personal witness, what you're doing at American Principles Project is crucial. Tell us about it. Well, what we're doing at American Principles Project is we're building an NRA style organization mm -hmm. for families. And what I mean by that is the same way that the NRA organizes gun owners to protect the Second Amendment, mm -hmm. we're organizing families directly in politics to protect their children, make it easier to get married, remove all those hurdles to family formation, and really create the next generation of American citizens. It's, it's that simple and, you know, frankly, um, it should have been happening a long time ago. Well, it is. You know, of course, I've been familiar with APP for a while, but some months ago when I saw the, the announcement of your big family initiative, I turned to my wife and I said, what do you think? Because you all put out this great video. She said, that's awesome. And then each of our kids in turn, you know, from age 19 down to 12 came up and said, dad, that's awesome. So I think you've got a real endorsement there, not just because it's, it's my family. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I think probably hundreds of thousands of Americans are saying thanks. Tell us what you're trying to achieve from kind of a policy point of view mm -hmm. with a big family initiative? Well, we launched the big family because everyone's got a special interest group in this town. There's big oil, big yeah. pharma, big tobacco, but there was no big family. There was no group um, making politicians pay a price when they vote against families, when they vote to take power away over our kids' education or any of those things. And frankly, I looked at my generation and how we're not getting married like previous generations used to. We're not having children the way that they mm -hmm. used to. And for me, I'm the oldest of 10 kids. I know that's odd. Uh, I have five kids with my six on the way. It's the best thing about my life. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to make something like the big family that made it easier to get married, have babies, and protect your kids when they're in school or just from the broader culture. There's so much going on here. And... Um, yeah, it's that simple. We're, I'm just basically trying to share the joy of starting a family, of leading a family, of, of ha just having a family, because I think that so many young kids are about to miss out on something really important and, and really uh, fulfilling. And uh, so we just want to share that with everyone. And, and it just so happens that it tends to be great for for societies, right? It, it, you know, there's the personal joy with families and having kids and 
but there's also the societal benefits and the political benefits, and it's all very, very important to get right. So as, as you scan the policy landscape, Terry, and, and I don't mean this in a partisan way, nor do I mean it necessarily in the way of kind of being a jerk about President Biden, who I think is doing an awful job. I just mean that as a kind of an objective statement. If you look at the Biden administration and, and what he has done and not done through the lens of family policy, mm -hmm. what's your assessment? Well, first of all, I think that both political parties have failed families. Mm -hmm. um, we are nonpartisan. We go after Republicans just as much as we mm -hmm. go after Democrats. And I think that the problem with Democrats, specifically President Biden, is that all of their policies, specifically economics to start with, mm -hmm. they're all designed to further separate parents from time with their children, right? Instead of giving t parents a tax break and making sure that they don't have to pay as much in federal taxes um, into social programs that they might not ever get access to, they're instead subsidizing daycare, mm -hmm. childcare, so that parents can spend more time at work, more time away from their children. And ultimately, I think that's the biggest failure. You, you know, there was an expose in the New York Times in the 1970s where a reporter embedded himself behind enemy lines and talk to Soviet women. And the women there uh, were shocked to know that American women didn't have to work, that they stayed home with the kids and they raised them. And it was concerning because in, in Soviet Russia, you aren't allowed to have your kids after three years old. They have to go to state-sponsored daycare and then the state takes care of them. And in a weird way, America's kind of chosen that, I think passively chosen that, right. um, just with the economic constraints. And so that that's the biggest threat, I think, outside of the social issues, and that's a whole other world. Mm -hmm. um, but economically, Biden and the Democrats, they don't want parents to spend more time with their kids. And in fact, they're saying the quiet parts out loud that parents shouldn't be in charge of their kids' education, that, they, that a lot of times parents are threats to the kids. And that's that's always a very minute um, minority of, uh, of people who are threats to their own children. Yeah, that, that's true. And, and yet in a, in a weird, ironic way, perhaps that's one of the silver linings of the COVID lockdowns. Obviously, there's nothing good about the COVID lockdowns, starting with the fact that they're overwrought. But the left always overplays its hand. And they, they really overplayed their hand when it came to saying what, what they had been believing out loud. All of that to say, do you think that the lessons from the COVID lockdowns, in particular, more working parents being able to spend time with their, their kids, produces an opportunity mm -hmm. for your big family project, for the larger cultural shift, potentially, back to more parents desiring to be home? I think that parents discovering more about their children's education mm -hmm. has given the pro-family movement an incredible amount of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, we now know just how terrible the education system is in this country. And when I say that, a lot of people assume that I'm talking about the radical social agenda around right. you know, gender and mm -hmm. sex and race. I'm not worried about that personally. I mean, I've been training my kids at very young ages. Like, if you try and tell them that men can have babies, they'll laugh in your face. So I, As they should. As they should. And uh, it, so I wasn't worried about that. But with COVID, I noticed something even more alarming, which is that my kids weren't learning anything mm -hmm. worth knowing. They're math, they're falling behind in math, they're falling behind in reading and writing. They don't know how to break cursive. And so at that point, we decided to start homeschooling because mm -hmm. it would be better for us to give to roll the dice with our ability to teach our kids, which by the way, just as a quick aside, parents teach their kids a lot, right? Yeah. Like we teach them how to talk, how to walk. Those are threshold. Uh, how to uh, behave in public. Right. And yeah. we, we, we teach that. I would encourage every parent to at least try homeschooling. It, it seems more overwhelm, uh, overwhelming than it actually is. But it was really the lack of a quality education of, of anything worth learning when it comes to science and math mm -hmm. and reading. That's why we pulled our kids out of school. And I think you're seeing that across the country. Um, I think that uh, homeschooling has increased by about 7,000%. Yeah, um, that's right. Totally crazy. Um, and that really says that parents are really willing to sacrifice for their kids. There is, unfortunately, a lot wrong with American education. And, and I, I lament that I have to say it that plainly. Educational attainment by every objective measure over the last 20 years of American students has declined relative to the rest of the world, especially the developed world. But one issue that you and I have spent a lot of time talking about over the last years as we've gotten to know one another is the effect of our education approach on young men. Mm -hmm. And it is decidedly fair 
whether someone wants to be focused on education attainment of young women or of young men, for us to recognize that what we have been doing the last 15 to 25 years in educational approach has harmed young men. We see evidence of that in every respect. Why don't you speak to that, especially for members of the audience who may intuit that that's an issue, but haven't spent a whole lot of time getting into details? Yeah, I think that the effects, while they might not appear to be clear, they're very obvious. We've seen an incredible increase in the amount of young men who are not employed, who don't have steady employment, um, who are who spend more time on video games, more time smoking mm -hmm. marijuana, addicted to pornography, lots of social problems. And ultimately, it's because I think we've created a society that rejects masculinity, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, um, it's called toxic masculinity. We've never heard that phrase used towards femininity, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think that that's because there's nothing wrong with femininity. There's nothing inherently wrong with masculinity. It's when masculinity becomes disordered or used to the wrong ends. Right. And that's actually when it stops being masculine, right? That's called effeminacy. And, yeah. um, and so we've created this whole world where uh, men, it's tough to describe. Men are very gritty. We like to work with our hands. Mm -hmm. we, we like to accomplish things. And we've replaced things that we used to do for accomplishments, building tables, building tree houses, building things with our hands um, with artificial video games, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and pornography online and dating sites. Like it's, it's just a world that we've created where strong, courageous men are not really welcome. They're kind of viewed or frowned upon. Um, and so that culturally that's really bad, but we also have basically given kids today and it's, it's goes to women and men, one option, go to college, go to yeah. college before you start a family, go to college before. And th there's, there's good arguments for that. But at the same time, Family is why you do everything. Mm -hmm. Family is why you get a job. Family is why you go to get a degree. You want to you want to have something that you can support your family with. And instead, we've created this culture that's simplified down to basically narcissists um, or narcissistic. It's uh, it, we focus on ourselves and our own individual accomplishments and not the accomplishments that we get for our families and for our children. And it's it's kind of gotten lost there. Yeah, it really has, and and it's well said. I mean, not not to go too into too much detail here, but I do want to tease out one follow up. I think about all the the time I've spent in the classroom, almost always in a co-educational setting with with young men and young women in the same classroom. And invariably the conversation in especially in history class would would get to masculinity and great leaders mm -hmm. and in early American history, you know, those who are famous tend to be men. But all of that to say that Often these students, early teenagers, young teenagers, would uh, sort of associate narcissism with masculinity, mm -hmm. which is a real misunderstanding. And, and, and what I, I mean by that is we need to understand that narcissism, narcissism is not masculinity. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's sort of held out as this cudgel to use against very well-ordered masculinity, very well-ordered femininity. Mm -hmm. How do we, outside the realm of policy and politics, in the realm of society and culture, get back to a proper understanding of men and women. Well, I think at the you know Mother Teresa said it hmm. way better than I ever could, which is if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. And what makes that say or that quote so profound is its simplicity. Right. Right. And and the problem that our generation has, millennials and Gen Z, is that. We don't have families to go home to and love, mm -hmm. right? A lot of us are still children in, in a lot of ways. We don't have our own wives. We don't have our own children. We, we are still children of our parents, and a lot of us are still living with our parents. Um, and so I think the number one thing is get married, start having babies, and love those families. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of misconceptions about family. It, it, it is a big sacrifice. But at the same time, there's nothing more motivating than a bunch of hungry mouths to feed or, or, or a demanding wife who wants you to make more money. Children and wives mm -hmm. and, and spouses, they, they, they challenge you to do better and to take the next steps. You know, you, I've even seen it in my own life. My wife and I, uh, we bought a small little house when we first got married. Then we started really having kids, kept upgrading, and I had to make more money and work harder. And mm -hmm. next thing I know, I'm, I worked hard enough to become the president of my own organization, right? right. And, and I don't think that that, that path is unique to me. I think that many men uh, used to, to to follow that path as well. That they would start their own small businesses. That's mm -hmm. what my dad did. He was in insurance, and then he started his own pizza place. And what do you know? Now we've got four pizza places open. Um, so it's really just about the simplicity of everything. Go home and love your family, and teach them the truth. Teach them reality. Teach them what makes what makes being a woman great. 
Teach them about what makes being a man great, and the rest will follow. Well, that's so true, and, and it isn't that the, the policy work that happens in the nation's capital or in state capitals is irrelevant. In fact, it's, it's rather relevant because government has gotten so big. It's just that it's not sufficient to fix the problem, right? In other words, in order to put government back in its proper box, we have to do a better job, starting with us, at rebuilding institutions of society that before government got too big, we're actually doing most of the jobs that government's now doing. And those institutions start with a family, right? right. Uh, they, they absolutely start with the family. And what I've learned is that government can actually do a lot more damage than it can do in rebuilding things. Um, one thing that we picked up on at APP is the federal ties to all mm. these cultural issues that we're dealing with, right? Like we're really upset about critical race theory being in schools. Well, how did it get into schools? The Department of Education and their federal grant agreements to the schools require them to have anti-bullying programs, diversity and inclusion and equity programs, all of that. So it's it's basically, like if, if we do our job, it's basically just getting the, the government out of the way, getting them to stop funding all of these garbage programs that are killing us, and then allowing parents to fill in that gap. Yeah. One of the very troubling aspects of that government-funded agenda is transgenderism. And there are a lot of things we can talk about that or talk about regarding that on the federal level, the state level. Obviously, this is dominating the news because of the courage of some political leaders. What I would like for you to do is, is speak to whether we're turning the corner on that not as a problem, but as a recognition that we're, as a, as a people, as Americans, that we actually have been hoodwinked by a sliver of a sliver. I'm talking about radical leftists mm -hmm. who, whether it's critical race theory, transgender extremism, spending way too much of our money in D.C., seem to have been running roughshod over the rest of us for a long time. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. This is a very complex issue. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's very simple. Yeah. Um, men are men and women are women. It's how we're created. Every species on the planet uh, is divided into male and female and all pertains to reproduction, essentially. Um, there are other aspects to mm -hmm. your biological sex that impact your life, but for primary purposes, the reason it's called your biological sex is because it has to do with reproduction. Um, and I think that's what's happened is we've been taken advantage of by our polite nature as Americans. Mm -hmm. America is a kind nation. We are a polite nation that wants to, for lack of a better phrase, live and let live. Right. Uh, we, we don't want to infringe or tell someone how they have to dress or how they have to act as society. Our laws are bare minimum. They're, they're basic uh, morality that's been enshrined into the legal system. And I think that they've taken advantage of our kindness and our willingness to live and let live. And now, it's gone into a more coercive phase where they're going to children, ch children who can't make up their own minds on things. I mean, my my kids, my three and five year old, they, they think that they're dinosaurs or WWE <laughs> wrestlers, right? Like at certain points mm -hmm. of the day, they have all these delusions. And the idea that you know, this is with this overreaction, right, to Governor DeSantis's bill that keeps schools or taxpayer funded from talking to children about gender identity or sexuality, uh, that there was an uproar it really shows that there's a great divide in America, not yeah. amongst the people. There are really, um, if you were to simplify it down most basically, there's the elite opinion stream, and that's our political class, it's the mainstream news media, it's academia, Hollywood, all of that, and then there's the popular opinion stream. The popular opinion stream, we've done so much polling on this, it's like 90-10. Yeah, it's overwhelming. Uh, they wanna be polite, they don't wanna ostracize people or make them feel bad, but at the same time, they want you to stay the hell away from their kids. Yeah. And I think that that's completely reasonable, not, not just reasonable, it's it's mandatory of any decent society to protect children from these things. So um, long and short of it, it, like transgenderism and the LGBT movement could only exist. It could only get a start in a non-bigoted nation, in a, yeah. in a kind nation that's polite, that's open to allowing people to dissent and, and disagree. No, that, that's extremely eloquent, and, and in particular that Americans rejecting the extreme agenda, especially in the policy uh, way, that does not mean that Americans are rejecting human persons themselves, that they're not going to be kind to them one on one. I want to ask you one final question, Terry, and it is sort of looking ahead. Uh, you spend a lot of time, as we do at the Heritage Foundation, 
just diagnosing reality. Mm -hmm. And whether it's the politics in the nation's capital or the culture of America at large, there's a lot to be concerned about. And yet, I know you well enough to know that you wake up each day to be an optimist. Mm -hmm. And so look at your crystal ball for our audience and, and give us a sense of what you think is going to happen in America in the coming years, in particular, what's going to happen with American families? Well, um, I think that there, you could always do worse, <laughs> um, but I, I am optimistic in the future. And it's because the future is going to rely on very simple things. People getting married, people mm -hmm. ha having kids again, people having an investment in the future of their society and of, of their communities. And we don't... the. We talked about that video that we made for the big family lunch. I just made a video showing the beauty of family, right? It, it, families are very attractive. I tell people, you know, even if you're overweight and have tons of acne, there's something really beautiful about a, a father holding his baby girl, right? There's something attractive about that. We want that. We have basic human desires to, to start a family and to reproduce. And so if we just get back to the basics where we make it easier to get married and, and we get rid of all of this, uh, you know, no fault, fault divorce baloney right. and, and all of that and really have marriage mean something again, I think we're going to be in a much better position much quicker than we all realize. I, you know, I said this earlier, there's nothing more motivating than, than a demanding wife or, or, or hungry children. And once we start having kids and we get married, we start to become more selfless. We start to think about the world and the future and we, have, we care more about deficits and, and, and high taxes, right? And so uh, the reason I'm optimistic is because it's all about the family. It's always been about the family. And America just got off track for the last 40, 50 years and started prioritizing government and business over families. And if we just, if we can transform one of the political parties, I think, you know, one of them will be easier to do this too. But if, if, if we can transform the, one of these political parties in, into the party for families, for working families, uh, I think America's brightest days are still way ahead of us and, and we'll be able to turn this thing around very quickly. And so for people who hear that, who see you say that, who say, man, I've kind of been down in the dumps. Uh, Terry, it, it has to be too late. You're saying, heck no, it's not too late. We just have to get started. That's exactly right. We, we've been asleep. We've been, look, if you look at where parents have been over the last 40 years, we've had to put mom and dad in the workforce. And mm -hmm. recently, you've had to have mom or dad pick up extra jobs. Like, I've, you get Uber drivers who have full time jobs right. and they have to drive Uber after work just to make ends meet. We've been asleep at the wheel. We've created an economy that's not built around families, that's built around individuals and big business. And I think that parents are starting to wake up. They're, that You see this at the school board meetings of, the, of parents flooding the zone and, and holding their elected officials accountable. And look, every election is an opportunity to turn this country around. And it, and it gives a real strong signal that we can do it and that there's hope on the horizon. And so if we just get back to basics, Focus on families, make it easier to get married and have kids again, protect the innocence of children, whether it's online or in schools. There's no limit to what Americans can accomplish. Terry Schilling, thanks for being here. Thanks for everything that you do for America, for American families. Thanks so much for having me, Kevin. You bet. Well, I hope you enjoy that as much as I did. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Big tech is out of control. If they can silence the sitting president, what can they do to you? The Heritage Foundation has been on the front lines, fighting for free speech. We spotlight big tech censorship, demand reform, and help you fight for your rights. Heritage was the first conservative organization to reject big tech's money, because this is too important. We won't be silenced. Today we're going to highlight how far the woke left is going to indoctrinate our children. The Biden administration officially endorsed, for example, gender reassignment surgery, puberty blockers, hormone therapy for minors experiencing gender dysphoria, on top of all of the things that local school districts are doing. Things, thank goodness, in an ironic way, that more of us are aware of because of COVID lockdowns. In some nationwide and societal efforts by the left to radicalize your children continue unabated until the year 2022. And there are some political leaders, thank goodness, who are standing up against this. But most of all, people like you are standing up against this. And so I'm going to swerve into some real detail about this to encourage you to continue the fight. Let me be really clear about something. The content that I'm about to cover 
is absurd. You can say that it's un-American, that it's not true. As a dad of four, as a lifelong educator, the, most, the worst thing that I can say is that it's harmful to kids. And as a people, as Americans across the political spectrum, it's time for all of us to stand up against it. And I hope you're taking some encouragement from political leaders in the nation's capital, from political leaders at the state level and the local level who are fighting against this. We need you in this fight. And you also need to know, if it's not already clear, the Heritage Foundation has your back. So let me be really clear. There are some books out there that are really awful. And so I don't usually have props here, but we're gonna have props today. And this first book, I Am Jazz, apparently is based on someone who's on TV. But I wanted to read one of the pages here. This is in the middle of the book. You can see the page, so you know we're not making this up. And it reads, I have a girl brain, but a boy body. This is called transgender. I was born this way. That's not the case. This, this was not, the person was not born this way. But in America, or some American schools, where you can now decide who you are and have science and doctors help you change yourself, this is what the education bureaucrats, what too many doctors are doing to take advantage of kids. How about a second example in case you're not incensed enough? Who are you? Well, if we turn to one of the pages, and just in the interest of time, selecting one page, it reads, kids know a lot about themselves. They know who they are by how they feel inside. This is your identity, who you feel like inside, who you know yourself to be. This can also change as you grow up or change from day to day. Your gender is just one part of your identity, what makes you, you. Once again, just to sort of treat this objectively, that's nonsense on its face. And this is a book that's assigned in thousands of American school districts. This is a book that many members of school boards have said actually isn't assigned, but nonetheless it is. But it gets worse, just in case you need a third example. And this is a gender spinner wheel. So I'm not going to make this up. I'm going to say I have, let's say someone's using this, a body that made adults guess girl. And then I can swirl this around. I am two-spirit, third gender. I like dancing, making things, instruments, animals, and gardening. Well, nothing against dancing, making things, instruments, animals, and gardening. But I will say, once again, as an educator and dad of four, that you see how in little tools like this, the radical left not only is using tools like this that are kind of fun, to sort of advance their agenda, they're doing something that's more sinister than meets the eye. They're trying to convince kids before they reach the age of, pu of puberty that there is something wrong with them. Because as most mental health counselors would tell you, and thank goodness we're getting a lot of studies about this with each passing year, that's the time that they can take advantage of these young people. Well, I could go on and on. In other words, there are a lot of books like this, but I'm going to stop there and pause to congratulate my friend and one of the senators from Texas, Senator Ted Cruz, for raising this issue during the recent hearing of Judge Kentanji Brown Jackson. You may remember that Senator Cruz, to much uh, argumentation by the other side, decided that he would use his precious time during these hearings to highlight that Judge Jackson, sitting on the board of Georgetown Day School, an elitist private school in Washington, D.C., that there were a lot of these books being, being used. Among the titles he mentioned were Critical Race Theory and Introduction, The End of Policing, How to Be an Anti-Racist, which sounds sweet but actually should be retitled to How to Be a Modern Racist. Senator Cruz focused the bulk of his questions on the following books, anti-racist baby, and stamped for kids. He said, Judge Jackson, on page 33, it asks the question, can we send white people back to Europe? That's what's being given to eight and nine-year-olds. Well, Judge Jackson will be on the Supreme Court, but the problem is that this agenda is also going to continue to be in our schools and in our society until we stand up against it. 
And I, like Senator Cruz, wanted to show you some books to let you know this is not fiction. This is not an exaggeration. This is happening, and it's being assigned to our kids in our American schools, and it's time for it to stop. Speaking of stopping, I'll stop there. That's going to be it for this week's show. I want to again thank my guest, Terry Schilling of the American Principles Project, and I want to thank you for taking time to join us. Don't forget to subscribe to The Kevin Roberts Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please give the show a five-star rating while you're at it, and tell a friend. Our movement is for everybody, because our solutions are for everybody. Take care, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.